Good evening. Welcome to the Center for Global Humanities at the University of New England. Uh, we are delighted to bring you another exceptional event tonight. Uh, and it's a, uh, it's just a, you know, uh, it will be a, a topic unlike any that we've covered in more than 11 years of programming at the Center. So our speaker tonight is Mark W. Moffitt. He is a research associate at the Smithsonian Institute. Uh, and he's the author of a book, a, a fascinating book called Swarm, How Our Societies Arrive and Thrive, thrive and Fall. And here is the uh, copy of the book. It's, uh, it's a huge book, but it's just one of those books that's going to leave a tremendous impact uh, on our thinking for decades to come. But anyway, uh, Mark Moffat has been called a magisterial work. His work has been called a magisterial work of monumental importance by Scientific American. Uh, columnist Michael Shermer, while Kevin Kelly, founder of Wide Magazine, tells us to read this manifesto if you'd like to have your mind changed. That's, that's saying something. One of only a handful of people to earn a PhD and that the world's most respected ecologist, Edward O. Wilson at Harvard, of course, is the, Moffat is a modern day explorer with more than a little luck on his side. Having accidentally sat on the world's deadliest snake, battled drag lords with dart guns and scrambled up a tree to escape bull elephants. For him, such risks are worth it as part of his mission to find new species and behaviors in remote places and often reporting them in the pages of National Geographic magazine. He's often been called Dr. Bugs, but has also been given the monikers the Indiana Jones of entomology, and he's an entomologist, by the way, in, in addition to being an anthropologist, the Martha Stewart of Dirt, and the Jane Goodall of Ants, the last given by Jane herself. He has had many articles in the National Geographic magazine and, a tr and many, many other accomplishments. So without further ado, I'm going to leave you with, uh, with uh, Dr. Moffat, and then we'll, I'll, get, I'll, get, I'll come back again with the Q&A session in, with me and the students. Mark? Uh, th thanks so much, Anwar, and uh, mm -hmm. it's a, a pleasure to be here, not there. In any case, it's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm an explorer by trade, actually. I'm one of the few people who can say this, so it's, it's very awkward to be f stuck at home in front of a computer. So, And uh, I've basically spent a lot of time traveling the world. I'm an ex skateboard artist uh, from a family that really hadn't left the United States. So... Uh, uh, I like firsthand experiences and taking things in and thinking about them. It's kind of the 19th century point of view on things. And I grew up reading the books of, of Alfred Russell Wallace and Charles Darwin and Bates and others, naturalists. And uh, they came back and thought about things. And this has been my approach. And so I've uh, managed to stay out of regular academics but still do a lot of academics. So, so far, so good. And so over these last few, well, over most of my life, but this last decade, and particularly this last six years, I've been focused on this, this book because I started to think about societies and what they are. And uh, uh, in the book, I basically describe them. I'll just read this out. A society is an enduring group other than our immediate families that we most fervently pledge allegiance to fight for and sometimes are willing to die for. We expect our society to last through the generations and that our membership in it will be involuntary. So these are different from most other kinds of groups that people form. Uh, and a conclusion of my book is that these societies have been there since the beginning. They are, they've been part of our nature going back uh, through time and pack till, uh, uh, before we split off from the chimpanzees. They've been focal points for our lives. And that is actually sounds fairly straightforward when you hear it, but in fact, it's sort of controversial because in sociology, there are quite a few uh, people and publications on societies as imagined communities, uh, things that came about uh, when mass media uh, congealed people around uh, nations and these nations formed then. But uh, going back in time, you can find that societies existed from the start 
In hunter-gatherer times, they were groups of bands. A band was a small group of uh, 30, 50 people, uh, but it was a temporary assemblage and people could leave those and go to the next band. And there was a lot of confusion even in the anthropology literature about whether societies existed. But if you ask someone back in, you know, a couple of centuries ago, uh, who was a hunter-gatherer, who they were, they would give the name of a group that was bigger than a band that had a territory and usually had several hundred people. So societies were quite small back then. And I've been fortunate to you know, visit some hunter-gatherer groups and spend time with different kinds of tribal groups and uh, part of the book is how human societies transformed over time. Um, but if you look back at the definition I gave, sort of the overview definition of what a society is, uh, you'll, you'll begin to recognize that there are things other than humans that do have what you could clearly call society. So honeybee hives, but also clans of meerkats and, and uh, lion prides and so forth satisfy this uh, definition of what a society is. And they share a lot of features that are interesting. And to me, they're interesting, not because of an, any genetic reason, and I study ants, um, but because there are things that have to happen for individuals to work together, to live in a group, to form a assembly that's clearly separated from the next group. And uh, those things and the profits they give the individuals and the groups are often parallel from one group to the next, whether it's because the animals are smart, uh, maybe like a chimpanzee and definitely like a human or uh, a dumb little ant, and they're smarter than you might think, uh, is a, almost irrelevant to the argument. So to me, the interesting part of all this started when I was looking at, um, who belongs where and why. And it became part of my career to start working more and more with psychologists and psychologists are studying issues of identity and what those identity means and what that might mean for an animal as well. And uh, part of that is uh, best shown by what I call the coffee shop story. And that is, we can't do that right now very readily, but remember the times we could just walk into a coffee shop and walk over and there'd be this barista making coffee and there'd be people all over the place and we just order a coffee. This is really extraordinary stuff and we never think about it, but this is impossible for most animals that live in societies. A chimpanzee would kill the chimpanzees in that coffee shop if it didn't know them, or they would probably first kill it, or at least a chimpanzee would run away in terror. Uh, we can pass people all the time that we don't know that we've never met and not give them a glance. And um, the thing there that really hasn't been emphasized is the importance of strangers to our uh, existence as human beings. We're around strangers all the time, you may think of strangers as slightly unnerving. You have to get over a certain fear of strangers, certainly to some degree. But, you know, in point of fact, you're dealing with uh, or exposed to hundreds and in New York, thousands of them every day and you, without blinking an eye. And uh, how is that possible when it's not possible for the chimpanzee? This was a big step and it made it uh, possible for us to form our nations of today, this step of being able to be around strangers. As much as anything intellectual, it's just that basic cognitive ability to be around strangers. And it's, what we're doing essentially is distinguishing strangers from foreigners. And even in psychology, they often confuse the two terms. A, you can have a foreigner living next door who's your best friend. They're visiting from, they're in school, but come, came here from India. Uh, you can have a stranger next door who you never met and is an American and you don't want anything to do with. So our brain is categorizing people in terms of where they belong as well as who they are. And our reactions to them include the ability to sense that they are 
outsiders, that they are foreigners. And this uh, is part of the cognitive skills we all have that have a lot of uh, great parts to them because we love being, uh, we love to celebrate being our nationality, but they have difficulties as well when we look at people we sense as being outsiders as lower than us in some kind of scale of humanity and so forth. So all these kinds of issues come up in the book and obviously it's a, a lot to cover. Um, so the, the, I call these two kinds of societies, the individual recognition societies, the chimpanzees have those. They have to know everyone in their society, which is called a community, uh, as an individual. A chimpanzee literally has to know everybody. There can be no strangers in a chimpanzee societies. Uh, and humans don't. I call those anonymous societies. And even early humans, hunter-gatherer groups of several hundred could easily include individuals at the far end of that territory who you've never met or know very poorly. So our capacity to be around others, strangers, has been there, I argue in the book, from the start. And how does this work? Well, basically humans, I describe as walking billboards for our identities. We have all kinds of traits and most of the discretion are fairly obvious things like language. Okay, the language of a foreign group is fairly clear, but a lot of countries, for example, have multiple languages and a lot of hunter gatherers spoke languages of their neighbors as well. Um, their traits include just a fabulous array of things. How we, there's a woman named Abigail Marsh, a professor at Georgetown who studies how humans uh, detect traits on each other. And you can pick out, you don't know you can, but you can pick out if you're an American, a fellow American from a great distance by how they walk or wave their hand. And you're surprised usually when you're asked to do this and you can do it. And most people can't figure out how they do it. And if you're shown, for example, another of our studies showed that if you see a, a photograph of a Japanese person with a neutral face, a Japanese uh, ethnicity person with a neutral face, you won't be able to say much about them. But if they smile, you'll, you should be able to tell if they're American. Now, Darwin famously said, you know, smiles are universal. These emotions are universal in one of her books. And it's been uh, one of these things we hear a lot about. Certain emotions are expressed supposedly the same everywhere. But in fact, we're doing them in subtly different ways, depending on uh, where we grew up. And those particularly include our societies. And I should back up and say, also include matters of ethnicity and race within societies. And that's part of the human story because what happened for humanity is that we uh, are able to get different groups together in one society. And it's clearly a remarkable thing because other animals do not do this. And early humans did not do this. Early hunter-gatherer groups did not have ethnic groups in their societies. They might have individuals. Individuals can transfer between societies. It's an arduous process. It happens in chimpanzees and lions and other species. You have to have outbreeding for practical terms. So animals are able to move between societies, but usually as individuals, and they usually have to become accepted, and that's tricky. In the case of humans, uh, someone, uh, say, often a woman, marrying a man in a different adjacent society. If they were hunter-gatherers, would have to learn the language and take on as many of the traits of that culture as she could uh, sufficiently to fit in, to be accepted. But we never fit in perfectly. And the distinctions still are there. And what happened in recent centuries, um, in, because it is a recent thing for humans, uh, is the capacity for different ethnic groups to be in the same society, where they're both the same and different, where they identify as part of the society. They, you know, in modern terms, they worship the same 
flag, know the uh, anthems and all these characteristics. And if they're well fit in, they actually walk and talk and act like the people of that society. Uh, but they are still different. And there's a uh, question of how that became because societies, when I looked across the animal kingdom, they never merge. Societies don't freely merge in African wild dogs, in ants, chimpanzees and humans. Uh, they don't freely merge. Uh, you can get some cases where they look like they merge, but what I'm talking about are healthy societies. If societies are falling apart, if there are only a few individuals left, human societies are formed through coalescence, particularly in the Southwest, certain Indian groups uh, in America, like the Creeks, are actually, were actually members of different tribes at one point uh, that were battled down to few individuals and they had to survive together. And you can see that in monkeys and other species where individuals can come together and form a society uh, just, just for the sake of pure survival. But healthy societies don't merge, uh, as far as I can tell, ever in humans and certainly not in animals. So how did all these ethnicities arrive? It was through some kind of conquest and subjugation. So the history of human societies started to change when we had chiefdoms. These were uh, simple horticultural peoples, not just hunter-gatherers. They started to have crops and they started to settle down and they started to be able to uh, capture each other and take over each other's territory and control each other. That was the first step. And these sort of battles continued and escalated and became transformed over time until we had obviously some uh, empires that have extended across continents. And despite all that, despite the tensions because of the origins of these people coming together, we are, to my mind, it's a remarkable fact that we are as, as effective as we are. We live together. We are very creative uh, in societies that have a lot of ethnic groups, they offer all kinds of possibilities of thinking about things in new ways, new solutions to things. And yet there's still that tension because ultimately all these societies had a dominant group in North America, uh, clearly uh, white Europeans, and the others had a lower status. And the question of those statuses staying low is, uh, a big one, and it seems like statuses can move up and down, but the dominant group uh, never cedes control. And uh, that is an issue, obviously a big social issue throughout time. And the fact that we can make this even work when it wasn't even an option for most of human history is a remarkable fact uh, for our species. So um, maybe I can just uh, stop there. We could talk about any number of other things. Thank you so much, Mark. What a, a great, you covered, all, miraculously, you covered some of the main themes in your book. So I'm seizing, uh, one of the last things you talked about, yeah, this notion of majorities and minorities in a, in a, in a society. And I, uh, I found a, a section on page 319 of your book, uh, fascinating. So I'm going to read part of it to you, and I'm going to ask you to comment if you don't mind, and just elaborate a little bit. So you say... <clears throat> People of Asian descent born in the United States may celebrate their country's flag, yet experimental studies show that they more readily associate that flag with white people than with fellow Asian Americans. At, uh, even when a member of a minority group may be part of a family of proud citizens going back generations, at some level, there is a sense of being, quote, a perpetual foreigner in one's own land, end quote, one study says. Meanwhile, the white Protestant American is rarely conscious of the fact that he inhabits a group at all. He inhabits America. The others live in groups, sociologist Milton Gordon writes. And so you further say, further down a little bit, say, people of the majority enjoy the luxury of expressing themselves as unique individuals more than do minority people who end up diverting more time and effort into identifying with their own ethnic group. Can you say some more about this? It's fascinating because you just mentioned it in your in your presentation. Yeah, well, it is uh, 
we as a majority people you know me being a white uh, european background american uh we literally have more uh, of our brain available for expressing ourselves individually i don't have to think all the time about uh, my particular culture the way a mexican american has to because every time a mexican or someone with mexican ancestry meets another american they are seen as mexican and expected to show certain traits and that limits their behaviors open to them and it's uh it's both good and bad it's not as if it's all bad because people love their ethnic groups mm -hmm. and showing those traits can be very important to their lives but it also means it's restrictive in terms of people's individual traits and characteristics and there's really almost no way around this um whatever do we do to try uh, to change it and it's, you know it's the same with uh, the sexes male and female there are expectations that you're met with in every interaction that you can't discard um because in fact uh, a mexican american who tries to be too much like the majority of group is going to be rejected by the majority group because you're not behaving properly, but they're also going to be rejected by their own group. And uh, uh, this is a well-known problem from sociology that's been described from, uh, so you have literally no home anymore. So mm -hmm. the, this, you should be aware of this in your own lives and uh, maybe you can work around it, but it's really kind of built into the way we perceive each other. Great, thank you. We have a question from a student, Augustus Mendoza. He's a business administration major. Augustus? Hi. Um, first, I want to say thank you for speaking and sharing your insight with the Center for Global Humanities in, in the University of New England. Um, it's always a great pleasure to be able to learn um, from uh, such unique interdisciplinary studies, um, especially regarding such a prevalent topic. So my question is, or the beginning of it is, Throughout the human swarm, you discuss how foreign entities are only accepted if they have a perceived value. In chapter 25, sorry, you mentioned how immigration doesn't account for a merger and equals, and that fundamentally little has changed. What insight can your study of this topic lend to the current debate in, U in the US um, regarding the de de sorry, desirability of immigrants, as well as our nation's evolution to build a wall from uh, perceived demographics? Well, I started to talk a little bit, uh, thanks Augustus, I started to talk a little bit about immigration there and immigration, I, I said was a relatively recent phenomenon. That is the, full terry, the fully voluntary mass movements of large number of people. That's what I uh, meant by immigration with the expectation that they will stay, that there is no gun to their head. And this is really a remarkable thing. Uh, you might find elements of it sometimes with the movements of people in the Roman Empire, but you go back and it's really something different that allows us to even consider that today. And the problem has to do with uh, these issues of dominance and status because immigrants were comfortable with immigrants coming if they find a place that doesn't compete with us. And that's fine and easy when uh, conditions are good and there's a surplus of jobs and so forth. So we're at this point in time anxious about immigrants because the resources are in short supply. People feel that at least. And so uh, even though this dominance uh, perspe perspective exists all the time, it becomes a critical problem uh, during times of social stress. And we're right in the middle of that now. And even back in the Roman empire, when movements of people were pretty unconstrained most of the time, they were a remarkable empire. Uh, uh, e when there was a shortage of food, the uh, Romans would throw out uh, some of the immigrant groups, immigrant groups from their their city and uh, uh, and it affected their perceptions 
of people based on where they were from. So across a large part of the empire, there could be movements back and forth freely. It was a single nation in that respect, a single society, but parts of that empire at the periphery were still not integrated and you know, uh, we're, always, we're always treated as very low level people and had to be tightly controlled and so forth. And you see that in China as well as any other of these great empires. This perception of difference is always there. We, we tend to look at each other in terms of oc occupying a hierarchy from exalted us on down to animals. And uh, we may not be at the top of the hierarchy. There are individuals like uh, uh, that have been uh, had a difficult time that don't realize they're not at the top of the hierarchy, but they still manage to perceive themselves in the highest way they can by looking at their own way of life as being uh, better than other ways of life and moving themselves up the hierarchy as much as possible. But immigrants don't necessarily even fit in. And uh, this kind of reaction to immigrants is something that's certainly very hard to manage anytime we're under stress. Optimists are, are thinking of times when we don't have this social stress going on. And of course, with populations increasing and fires and famine and so forth, this stress has been elevated in the last two years. Thank you yes. very much. Uh, you, you were talking about Jefferson. He was very, Thomas Jefferson was wary of uncontrolled immigration and, and uh, how it might warp uh, or bias America's direction and render it a heterogeneous, incoherent, distracted mass. Uh, and, and so uh, it's very interesting. And just to, to, to stay a little bit with this theme of immigration, uh, you talk about the, uh, sometimes it's mutually beneficial to both sides, you know, the host country and the immigrant, you know, they both get something out of it. But the one thing I was waiting for you to mention is the, the, the role of the illegal immigrant. So uh, how, how does one theorize the, uh, the place of the, the person who comes illegally into a country without the consent of the host country? And it's like, it's, it seems to be like almost like the reverse of the uh, conquest that is very common among nations. So it's a different kind of... Uh, conquest uh that uh, so i wish i was hoping maybe there's a different part of the book right. that i missed but the, the 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 role of the illegal immigrant historically i used to i used to compare him i used to like to see them side by side with the tourists so the tourist travels freely around the globe because they have the money and all and they do things but the illegal immigrant also travels but takes huge risks to get into the country and how they manage to adapt into the country that doesn't want it in the first, that doesn't want him or her in the first place. So that's another conversation. Unless you want to comment, yeah, I'll comment on that now because yes. uh, yes. yeah, no, it's uh, there. Are, there are basically two things going on with citizenship, in my view. Mm -hmm. There's the legality of citizenship, and it's our it's our mental perceptions of citizenship, and those come in conflict rather often. If uh, you know people, migrant workers and so on, can come in and leave and, and not be expected to behave uh, like us. But there's a there's a quite a bit of stress around the possibility that, you know, people passing a citizenship test uh, end up knowing, you know, famously in the U.S., a lot more about this country than do we you, do. Yeah. You know, the details that we've never learned. And being a citizen of a country, feeling like you're a citizen or feeling someone else is like a citizen, uh, deserves to be a citizen, isn't a matter of their perception of facts. You know, people who are angry that someone is here isn't and aren't interrogating those others on how much they know. It's how much they fit in. It's our, our physical perception, our brains registering who belongs. It's registering foreign accents, it's registering the way we walk. We don't recognize that we can tell an American walk, but it, I'm sure we register all these kinds of things. And this, uh, this walking billboard I talk about ends up being hundreds of traits that we take in. And if we're not satisfied 
we don't feel comfortable with them in that coffee house when we walk by, say. We recognize them as not being there really. Uh, it's their way of, it's a way, membership is a way of being in our minds that is, and that is different from the way the government uh, sees membership so yeah. or, or citizenship. T.H. Marshall is a famous uh, a scholar in Britain who of uh, citizenship, and he talked about a citizen being a fully accepted member of the community. And it means, what does it mean by full? Because we're not really seeing each other as 100% members. We're actually assessing differences all the time. And uh, that is a problem. Yeah. So Morgan Bates, a public health major, she has a question for you. Morgan. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you for your lecture. So at the beginning of your book in chapter 26, you mentioned the Sigve and Alo tribes at, of Fatuna. Uh, the two tribes, tribes live at odds for all day, all year but one day, and they've never once tried to overthrow the other. Based on this anecdote, what would you say between conflict of humans is inevitable or can we overcome it? Oh, well, um, I don't think it's inevitable. It's very hard to... to uh cast off entirely. Uh, we don't have to see outsiders, others as beneath us. We, uh, we can be, particularly if we are uh, not nationalists, but patriots say, if we, if we, we, we we're have a warm feeling of our own group, uh, we, can, we don't have to have, have that come about as a result of having negative feelings about another group. The difficulty is, when there are resource shortages, when there are job shortages, when there are problems, uh, our minds tend to drift in that direction. Uh, and this kind of thing is uh, uh, something that really intrigues me throughout the book and that comes up in a number of different ways. For me, the, the example there was one that I used to show that we may always need uh, societies. There's this talk of cosmopolitanism that we can drop societies and live in one vast happy family. But psychologically, societies give us a sense of belonging, of richness, of experience and so forth. And uh, so I tried to find out if there was ever a case where there was one society. And I looked at these places in isolation like Fortuna where there was just had enough space for these two tribes and nobody else, just two tribes. And for hundreds of years, they never merged. And normally they're chieftains, they conquer, chieftains conquer other chieftains and they never did it. And the theory there that I put forward is that, you know, you need an outsider. And so they, they kept this uh, second group, even if one was stronger in one decade and then the other in the other decade, they, they, they stayed apart. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean uh, a total annihilation, fortunately. But it also doesn't mean that we can all become one happy family. The, UN, the Euro European Union is going to stay fragmented into countries. The UN is not going to become, you know, the uh, government of the world. The nations are still going to be here. And uh, there's a lot of good to that, as well as the bad, of course. But Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Morgan. So, I mean, the, uh, I was wondering, because we have managed, and you said the human brain hasn't changed since the, at least the appearance of the Homo sapiens. Uh, so uh, yeah. how, how, how have humans managed to process this tremendous, this vast amounts of anonymous uh, anonymity, if you will, that is modern nation, that are modern nation states? Yeah, well, it's uh, it's because it's easy. I'm surprised more animals don't do it. And the thing is, and I didn't mention it earlier, that one animal that does do it are the ants. And we are remarkably, ants are remarkably like us in this regard. Small brained as they are, they allow for strangers, whereas most vertebrates can't. And the thing, what, what is true for ants is they use these, what I call markers of identity, all these things I'm talking about, walking, talking, all these features that we see on each other all the time that we assess constantly at a very high rate. 
uh, we don't even know we're taking them in, but we are. It's something ants do, and they do it in a simpler way. They don't have hundreds of traits. They have a scent, which is their national flag. And as long as you have the right scent, which is a matter of both genetics and upbringing, what the colony eats, you're golden. And, uh, you know, so if you add another ant, and as long as it has the right scent, no one's going to notice. You add another 10 ants, no one's going to notice. You add another million ants, no one notices. And essentially, humans do the same thing. As long as people uh, um, fit in in the way that it's expected, as long as we're comfortable comfortable with them in the coffee shop, to use that metaphor, uh, uh, or story, uh, we can add individuals one after another. And I can say that we can do something that ants can't do, which is really important. And that is we can uh, actually deal with foreigners in a uh, constructive way. Ants are totally nationalists, if I can use that term, and a kind of fits, yes, did. because they, they kill anyone from the outside, anyone. They don't, you know, they never form alliances. Uh, humans can, so that coffee shop can have members of, you know, uh, other cultures that you're familiar with and comfortable with, and you can be comfortable there with them in the same room as well. That doesn't mean they're not perceived as foreign because we are um, assessing these things that have, amazingly high rate. Researchers show, Alex Todorov and others show that we basically take in people's identity within the blink of an eye. So if you're moving through a group of people, your mind is doing this all the time and you're doing it subconsciously. And the wonder of this is it doesn't take any cognitive effort. At least it doesn't burn out your brain. Imagine being a chimpanzee and having to keep track of everybody all the time, having to walk by individuals and know who they are all the time. We have a much lo lower cognitive load, that is amount of effort we have to expend because of this. That's why I'm amazed more animals haven't found this trick. Yeah, no, but that's fast. Unless you're a clever spider, you can cloak yourself in, a, in the scent of an, of an ant colony and get in and get their larvae, right? <laughs> so, Oh, yeah, it's one of my favorite stories, right? I tell an ant story then? <laughs> yes. Uh, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to allow Alyssa Nicholas, she's a nutrition major, to ask a question. Nicholas? Hello. Thank you so much for being here and for your presentation again. Um, my question was, on page 195, you mentioned the concept of recognizing human groups at an early age, with the example of a baby developing food preferences through molecules transmitted from the mother. Are there any other human habits that are developed from the mother while in the womb, such as initial language development, etc.? I believe there is some evidence on uh, at least identifying the voice of the mother. Uh, there's a researcher, Kinsler, in Chicago that would probably take on this subject, but I'm not sure if she's looked at actual uh, language in that early stage. But, you know, uh, infants know language very early on and, uh, and ethnicity very early on. So even before they're told, uh, can speak and ever be told about ethnic groups and what to think about ethnic groups, they... Uh, you know, a two or three month old infant will look towards a, uh, uh, another individual of its parents' ethnicity uh, much more readily than it will someone that is more foreign to it. So these kind of cognitive biases uh, come about early and they make sense because it's how we deal with the world, everything in the world. We, we have to categorize things or we'd have to, we, our brains would run out of space. We have to throw, put things into categories and we do that with humans too. And uh, those, uh, those identifications have nothing to do with training. Uh, how we treat those people has to do with training, uh, how, what we learn later about those different groups, but our minds actually start picking out these groups very early on. Yeah, but uh, I would guess there's a lot of possibilities for research about uh, what happens in the womb in terms of learning, uh, even things like that. Thank you.
Good question. Thank you. So, so Mark, I have as I as I saw this this amazing capacity we have as humans to uh, identify markers and and basically roam the planet and the world without feeling estranged from and feeling somewhat comfortable among strangers. Do you think we have lost something in that in the process of having of having developed that that capability as human beings? Oh, an interesting question. You know, uh, as I say, you know, we're built with our psychologies and our emotions are built around some of these groups. So, you know, to take them away would take away a lot of uh, human emotions. We're, we're thrilled by the, you know, the rituals of our groups and everything else. So unless you want to become uh, Spock and Star Trek and get rid of those emotions and strip them down, uh, most people would insist they're gaining more than losing from this capacity to see each other in terms of this kind of connectedness and all these things that come with it. Because, because, are, because Governor yeah. Morris, one of the authors of the Constitution, he has, and I was reading a book recently, and he's quoted as saying that he doesn't trust people who do not uh, love their country, or basically people who, was, who claim to be citizens of the world, basically. And... Uh, it's just like you have a quote there by Voltaire who's talking about the citizens of the world. So people who have that ability to be connected to everything and everyone seem to be unable to have that, those deep affections uh, for one's pueblo or one's nation or one's community. Yeah, well, the question is how deep that is because... Uh, uh, whether whether that's really true. Okay. And I think there are people, certainly a fair number of people who like to have that point of view, uh, but we end up having these biases we don't recognize we have. Uh, Mazarin Banaji at Harvard studies this among others. And, you know, you may think you think of others as equal and so forth, but if you look at our, our responses, Hidden away are these, these biases, and it's good we override them, well, we can override them, uh, but it becomes part of a, a big trick of being human because people who are uh, heavily biased against another group can often come, up as, uh, come out off as seeming to be the least biased about them uh, because they overcompensate whether and uh, people who uh, want to get rid of these biases in themselves when they take one of Mazarin's tests and find out that they actually do have these biases and didn't realize they do and want to get rid of them. It's uh, like trying to think of the elephant in the room more that you the more you think about the fact that you have a bias, the more the bias actually ends up showing up. And so yeah, it's it's always going to be a, a tricky game to play to get our uh, to our, our minds in the right balance. Um, so, so it's always going to be there. It's going to take you know someone's going to have to be able to snip out part of our <laughs> brain to actually get rid of it. But yeah. on the whole, I think people uh, gain so much from it that they wouldn't want to lose it, even if they think they want to have a cosmopolitan society. I don't imagine that they would deny people having their, you know, local celebrations and so forth. And those connect with people's identities. Yeah. So Jacob Odette, who's a medical biology major, has a question. Hello. Towards Thank the you. end of your book, you mentioned that there is a deepening divide between us and them in a form of strong nationalism and various forms of racism. You mentioned that if we don't recognize these problems, we will remain on the same cycle and that this problem will continue to grow. What suggestions do you think or that you would make uh, for people to become more aware of this issue and so we can find a solution? Yeah, well, right now it's tricky because what I talk about awareness of these issues, we're talking about science and there's a, a denial of science thinking from a large portion of the population now. So it's a shifting topic, to a shifting target to figure out how to sort out these questions. But um, I think ultimately, uh, we do have to recognize at least that we do have these biases, but many people will not 
uh, one to even be believe this point. Uh, once you recognize you have these biases, you can train yourself and train others to handle them. And certainly part of this training should be that these uh, looking at others uh, as different groups doesn't include giving them all the baggage of these negative traits, but our knowledge of our, the histories we come with are pretty well entrained in our brains too. And, you know, blacks have a history with slavery that they can't get away with, or get away from, even though they would certainly like to. And you would have to make us all, our brains all blank slates and start afresh. Um, to actually erase these things. The best we can do is, uh, I think, keep uh, the social stresses that underlie these things under control. Uh, and that, of course, is a, a difficult problem, not in my field, economics and so forth, but actually the social stresses is what leads to the most of these problems. And uh, unless you can handle those, uh, those, those kinds of issues will continue to be around. Thank you. Mark, you talk about the, uh, the life and death of uh, societies. In that they go through cycles of life and death. You know, perhaps they last anywhere between two and five centuries before they, uh, they go through profound changes if they don't cease to exist altogether. So that's a, fa that's a fascinating concept. So even something as seemingly inorganic as a society seems to have replicate a natural cycle. Yeah, I actually uh, estimate in the book sort of uh, back of the envelope that we've had like a million societies over yes. the course of human history, most of them tiny little societies, but in each one of them, those people like we do today thought of their society as the pinnacle and all these traits is wonderful and most of them have disappeared. And, you know, the, the, most of the emphasis has gone into questions of collapse and calamity. That was Jared Diamond's mm -hmm. uh, focus. And Jared looked basically at just a few instances where societies uh, fell apart. He called them collapses, but the, they don't collapse. When you look at, well, there's a whole history to this. Early society, I, I'll just say a few things about what happened. Early societies uh, were hunter-gatherers, and then it was the lack of information. So hunter-gatherers were spread out over a territory in these little bands, and year after year, they would all thought of themselves as the same people. They had a name for themselves, they had a certain culture, religion, but the people at the far end of that uh, territory you know, would start drifting in how they dressed or how they interpreted the religion. And when they came together, say, for an annual ceremony or something, it would they would seem a little different. And, and after a while, and it took actually on average several centuries then too, uh, it became intolerable and societies would split. And these little hunter-gatherer territories would split in half. The first sign it was going to happen was that they changed, one half would change their name for themselves. That's not a good sign. Now, when societies started to grow bigger uh, and conquer each other, you ended up with societies that were actually patchworks with different former independent societies occupying different places. And those led to possibilities for so those nations and empires and societies in general to fragment, usually along those ancient lines where you know one side had a different language, but had a different culture and different flag, they could all fall back on those things. So societies tended to fragment. And what uh, Jared Diamond was talking about were cases where societies would break apart into smaller fragments that were simpler because the larger society could sustain more resources and growth and infrastructure and so forth, but were still societies. Uh, people did not just wander off into the rainforest in the Mayan empire when one of those empires fell apart. They retained some kind of simpler society on a smaller scale. So these smaller societies would then start conquering again. And in the case of the Mayans would extend out and then smack, fragment back into smaller uh, groups again and again. You can see that through history. If uh, uh, the Spanish had arrived several, uh, maybe a century later, they would have 
faced a much more daunting prospect because the Mayans at that time were five kingdoms. They would probably have expanded into one. That would have made them a much harder target for them. So these cycles are seem to be built into societies of simplification and growth, simplification and growth. And uh, there's evidence, as far as I can tell, throughout the animal can, kingdom that societies are never permanent. They go through this cycle just like individuals do. And uh, uh, so, yeah, I, in the book I talk about identities shifting and societies shattering. And so it's in each case, yeah. how people perceive each other, whether they fit or don't fit and have the opportunity to separate if they don't feel like they belong anymore. And that we have that problem, of course, now, because individuals that don't feel like they belong in the same society end up being together. And, uh, you know, civil war has been the historical way of dealing with that. And uh, hopefully that won't happen here again. But. So Hayden Cohen from Environmental, Environmental Science has a question for you. Hi there. Um, I'm sorry you didn't get to tell your ant story earlier, so I have an ant question for you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> hey, how, how do you say your name? Hayden? Hayden. 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 Oh, yeah. Uh, doing well. So the question is, use the model of invertebrate societies to look at social interactions in humans. Bug colonies must experience pandemics. Well, epidemics. Um, what do you recommend that we can learn from bug colonies in addressing our current pandemic? Yes. Well, they have invented the mask, but they have, uh, they <laughs> ants are very focused on their society level. Uh, and so they do not often you know, focus on their own uh, self and health, uh, uh, health and safety, for example. So a sick ant will tend to wander off and die on its own rather than be around its uh, colleagues, which gives uh, reduces the chance of a disease spreading. Um, there are, you know, what happens in ant colonies depends on the size of the colony from small to large. And there's actually a lot of parallels that I talk about in one chapter of the book of between human societies starting off as small hunter-gatherer groups expanding into empires and ants starting off and little groups can be as small as a few dozen into societies of millions. And uh, as you get into societies of millions, you have to have more infrastructure and, and uh, uh, more complex ways of dealing with problems, both for ants and humans. And it has nothing to do with intelligence. An ant that didn't solve health issues, if it had a society of millions, would be dead. So they evolve these mechanisms to keep the colony healthy. So large colonies of leafcutter ants are my favorites because they have whole sanitation squads that are very diligent. They're full time on the sanitation duty and they take any disease organism and they carry it down and down and down into the soil. Uh, in some cases, as deep as 30 feet, which is you know miles down in human terms where they have these underground bunkers where they put the trash as we deal with nuclear waste in some cases, as far away from everything as possible. And those ants actually die young because they're around diseases so much, but it's a it seems to be a choice they make. Some ants take that job. No one seems to force it on them. So fast. I would say for one thing that the ants uh, invest a lot more in health and public safety than humans do. They've been at it a much longer time. So we might take that particular um, attribute seriously about them, that it's an important thing for a large society to have, invest in it. Thank you. Thanks, so, uh, several times in the book, Mark, you, you know, it's clear to me, and I'm not a biologist, too, I mean, it's that humans are almost exceptional in their ability to create society and, uh, uh, and to identify markers and uh, a variety of them, and therefore, uh, and have the ability to expand almost indefinitely to the point of extinction, extinction maybe. And um, so, I'm, uh, you know, I'm struggling with a question now because what do you, so do human beings have a very special place in the natural and animal order? And uh, just like some people think, uh, people but may, maybe who have, who have a religious persuasion or, or people who see human beings as a very special 
uh, and its uh, species. Um, so it, it seems to be true just by the ability to do these things, from anything from writing to uh, uh, building these massive societies. Uh, there's no one like them in the animal world. Yes. Well, there are some weird things that go on. So sperm, <laughs> uh, there are certain whales that actually yes. seem to have poles that they use, much like an ant scent, to identify their nationality. And they have, uh, they're spread out over the ocean, and there can be thousands and thousands of them at least. So we're not totally unique, but we certainly are totally unique in turning it into this smorgasbord of impossibilities that happens to work together. And, uh, you know, it's just uh, the, the problems that we work through, many of them through history have had to do with their identities. So things like uh, domesticating uh, horses and building roads and riding and so forth are all, all contributed to how, uh, us maintaining an identity over a bigger and bigger space. Uh, early hunter-gatherers couldn't do it because people would just drift off and start doing things in different ways. Now, you know, once you had roads and you could convey the what, what the king is saying about how to dress, people kept their dress the similar ways and so forth. And those means of uh, communicating, uh, simple as they seem in this regard, are actually one reason that nations have managed to stay together as well as they do. And uh, so, but you know, and the other part of your question is, are we like animals are different? And we are more like animals in many ways than you'd think. And uh, when I look across the animal kingdom at all these different species, they, the, 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 the gains from being in societies tend to fall into two broad areas. Uh, the, the, there's the protection aspect of keeping a group safe. If you're in a safe society, why would you leave? So animals tend to form these protective groups and a provisioning aspect of, a, of, of nurturing and making sure everyone has food within the society, dealing within the society. And that's, those are two points of view that I connect with patriotism and nationalism. Patriots tend to be more focused on the nurturing aspects, education, health, welfare of individuals, and nationalists tend to look outward and think about protection more. And an interesting uh, question is uh, uh, whether these things exist in other species. And in fact, in ants, it turns out there are colonies where some of the individuals tend to be all focused on the attack and the other ones are feeding the young all the time. And if you take away the ones that are feeding the young, uh, uh, the attackers, the colony starves, because the attackers are not doing anybody any good. You take away the attackers and social parasites move in and uh, destroy the nest from the outside. And so a healthy ant colony has to have a, a balance between individuals with these two uh, ways of uh, conducting themselves. And arguably, I would say that humans could have this uh, balance as well. You know, patriots and nationalists don't necessarily, necessarily get along very well, but it may be the stress between them, the, uh, the constant fight between them, the interplay, is part of the process by which societies survive because we have to have those two perspectives to keep going. At least there, there's bits of evidence from the animal kingdom that seem to make sense if you think of it that way. Would, the question I have, for, for example, would you say that the human nature, ha, or at least some of us, some of us, some members of the human race, have been modified, have changed, in the, have changed, have been transformed by let's say the development of writing and other technologies since the appearance of Homo sapiens and therefore develop this ability or this capability that was not available to, let's say, prehistoric uh, human communities. Well, I think the, to me, the, uh, the, uh, the null hypothesis should be that nothing has changed. Okay. And that to me is really interesting because if you, you know, if aliens went, uh, arrived on earth 20,000 years ago 
and saw these hunter gatherer groups and came back today and saw modern China with 1.2 billion people, they would assume something evolved in our brains, but it doesn't seem to be. It seems to be that uh, that capacity was there from the beginning. So my point of view is that uh, it makes more sense to look at much of the basics of human nature as having been there from the start, uh, including the possibility of settling down and forming cities. I think the more we get evidence from the distant past, we'll find more settlements, though be small in the distant past, but we think of hunter-gatherers as being mobile and moving around a lot. But I don't think, I think that was part of our, our cognitive skill set to choose to sit, uh, settle down or be mobile. And those two forms of life, the settling down one, led eventually to nations. And we've mostly lost the hunter-gatherer perspective on life of freely moving around over a space. And, but that's still built into us. If we, we were born in a hunter-gatherer society, we'd do just fine with it. Well, let's say the technology of reading and writing or writing and reading has had no effect in the way we organize ourselves, or has it? Oh, I, I mean, I, I'm sure all these things have. I, I mean that uh, as us as human beings, a hunter-gatherer being plopped into our society or us being plopped back to their society, these were all part of the, 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 this tool set that we've had in an expansive way. But clearly uh, uh, what reading and writing has done is uh, become a memory enhancement technique without parallel. And you know, humans have always told stories around the campfire and uh, kept information going, but it's always been shifting and changing over time. Writing has set it down into stone. So changes have to be, uh, uh, have to be of a different sort to take place. We can't deny what our, uh, you know, our predecessors 10 generations ago thought or did. We can reinterpret them, of course. But yeah, and uh, again, this has to do with the stability of society issue in terms of writing, solidifying laws and so forth, which happened as we settled down. But our brains haven't changed. That to me is the interesting part. Mm, interesting. Well, that being the case, I, I'm sure that a hunter-gatherer would, nev would never have written a book like this of this size. So it's a wonderful book I highly recommend. Uh, it just, uh, we just get a, uh, an idea about what the themes that are elaborated and discussed in this wonderful book. And uh, I wish we had more time with you, my, uh, Mark, but uh, I think we're going to... You You're going to track me down sometime if you yes. need any questions. Or your students. I hope uh, those were great questions. I really appreciate it. That was a, a wonderful uh, uh, evening to have before tomorrow. Yeah, people that might be listening. This as a recording later. The election is tomorrow, so we're all going to be intrigued how ant-like we are tomorrow in our in our voting <laughs> and other behaviors. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you.